for the course <coughs> grand finale speaker. So I'd like to introduce more formally Cameron John, Cam John, who was an MBA here once upon a time, and also a physics undergrad from the U of A, so uh, once upon a time, and has had a longer journey since then through a bunch of jobs. I had mentioned uh, the private equity, equity firms, through Deloitte, through consulting, um, back through other exec training, and also now as a CFO with DICORP, local oil services firm. So Cam has a broad perspective, and he's been working on this perspective for a fair amount of time. He's, yeah, he's been in finance, but he's been in M&A, he's been in this, he's been in management. So he's a, he's a good person to share, and also in the room, and one of you guys. So please welcome him. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, it was uh, particularly interesting hearing uh, your opening story and the slide where um, I think the quote was, uh, being able to decide what not to do was one of the challenges. And I think at one point that's how Michael Porter defined strategy was deciding what not to do. Um, and quite frankly, deciding what to do is difficult with a group of colleagues or a management team or building business strategy, deciding what not to do is equally as tough. So I thought you kind of set the stage really well. Um, topic I'd like to talk about today would be, and engage you guys in discussion, uh, would be really discussing strategy development at growth organizations. Often many of the business cases uh, that you see or read about involve multi-hundred billion dollar companies and takeovers with large strategies. And then when you take that and try to apply it to our own organizations or the groups that we work with in companies, growth companies or mid-market companies, it seems like sometimes maybe there's a disconnect <coughs> as to how strategic planning and actual strategy and execution uh, ends up coming about. So I was hoping to discuss that. Um, and that's essentially what I understand you guys were learning in this course. But at first, let's do some quick introductions. Um, Dev called me out. I do have a physics undergrad degree and a couple of professional designations and an MBA here from about 11 years ago. Um, but I'm a, I'm a quant, generally, a numbers guy. How many other quants in the room? So about 45%, and the rest are all poets? <laughs> yeah, or both? Any both? Equally weighted? No, you're nodding your head. You're neither? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Right on. Um, okay, because there's some some parts of the presentation where I could dive into uh, maybe some numbers are more technical, but given it's equally balanced, I'll try and balance the presentation that way. Um, so interestingly, we just concluded yesterday a hundred days of strategic planning at the organization we're at right now, and. Uh, uh, but before I jump into that, just a quick, quick background on some observations of strategy. Dev covered off exactly um, kind of what my background is, but what I wanted to just highlight really quickly um, was thematically, being a banker or investor really, you look at prudent investments. Uh, being a corporate finance advisor, really it's trying to make quality decisions about the company that you're in right now and whether you need growth capital or how to grow next. As a CFO, trying to make the right choices in guiding teams. And in all of these situations, I've seen both some pretty disastrous results. Our biggest client, Sanjal, went bankrupt and we were owed a million bucks about four years ago when the downturn hit uh, in the oil field here. At Deloitte, we used to pick up bankruptcy and distress files and do distress M&A. So we've seen where that didn't work out. And I've also had one bankruptcy as a banker where I saw a directional drilling company fail, and we had to take them to uh, Ritchie Brothers to get liquidated. Um, the reason why I'm bringing that up, and then as well I sit on a couple boards, or I sit on one board now and I was governance chair at both looking at strategy, the reason why I say that is, is because really at the end of the day, when looking at evaluating a strategy and the quality of a strategy, um, I have heard from our current strategy advisor, we debated a bit, but we came to the conclusion that really it's about whether or not you get a good return on your investment and define return by outcomes, financial outcomes, social outcomes, and investment would be time, attention, human capital, capital dollars. So 
in some cases, I've seen where the strategy was actually quite poor or non-existent, and I can assure you there's a direct correlation between that and failure. But as well, I've seen a bunch of companies where individuals took you know, in excess of $50 million out on a transaction from selling a company that was less than 20 years old. And in those cases, there was very well-defined crisp strategies in almost all of them. And the ones that didn't have strategies had such a simple business that the strategy was to execute really well. So I'm just kind of highlighting before we jump into some of the details as to how we unpack and unwind what I think I've seen, um, some of the themes. But as mentioned, uh, we have uh, discussed with strategy advisors how to develop a strategy at our organization. And we needed some assistance, we needed some outside help. It's been a while since we had a strategy refresh. So we talked to seven strategy advisors. And they all gave slightly different advice, and that's the first slide on the handout that I passed out to you. And it's interesting, because in a real-world environment, you have half an hour to inter interview a strategy advisor that a board member, or someone that I used to use in a prior life, or an ex uh, U of A prof was actually one of these, and at which point you consume what they're telling you, you look at their background and bio, and now as an executive team, you have to select who are you going to pick and why. So just take maybe 30 seconds to a minute and quickly read through some of the comments. Just a cursory review. And if there's anything that jumps out at you, note it. Okay, you looked up. <laughs> What, was there anything there that you particularly thought, hey, that is intriguing, or hey, I don't know why that person is saying that comment? Advisor sales. It's kind of interesting because it was bringing the employees into the equation. Number six? Yeah. Need clarity because you need employees to make decisions? Very good observation. I would agree. Number six was our second choice. We didn't hire them, but they, they were my first choice. Yeah. I didn't like the first part of number six. It does sound like they're standing in the middle of that's right. Uh, in fairness, though, um, is there a perfect answer, do you no. think? No. Somewhat subjective. Any other observations or anything that particularly stood out? Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe some of these here, and I'm just sort of reading the bulk, but some of them had to do with like intangibles, so it's value driven and five, and it's, it's like about purpose and seven, and where maybe my cursory inspection of like one and two, they're, they're more tactical into tangibles. Um, you know, get your accountability right. It's about engaging people, control the process. So those to me seem to be like two different perspectives. One was kind of yeah. conceptual, one was like very- More tactical. More tactical. Brass tacks. I agree. Our observations and our selection in the end, we ended up using Advisor 2 and Advisor 7 for two different reasons. Advisor 2 is the ex-U of A prof who um, actually helped us form a basis and do an environmental scan to understand what we needed to do next. And Advisor 7 is the one who ended up helping us actually deliver uh, strategies for our different business units. Uh, Advisor 6 was my first choice that uh, you point out to yeah. and I must think alike. Advisor 7 was picked for a very specific reason. And in hindsight, it makes a ton of sense. They said start with a focus on purpose, then to strategy. I'm at a 60-year-old company. The founder is the CEO's grandfather. The CEO ended up buying the company about 10 years ago. He's a good friend of mine. He's a very smart guy. Understanding your purpose, though, for an inherited business or organization and crystallizing it, is often from what I have seen in multi-generational family-run businesses where there's identity, there's personal net worth, and income tied in, unlike regular CEOs where 
personal income, maybe some net worth, usually no identity tied in. So with the identity part, focus on purpose then to strategy really stuck out to our CEO and he thought, let's use that. So we did. So I'm going to show you some of the results on that, on how we've uh, evaluated this and moved on. By the way, there is no right answer. It's all highly subjective. Um, an oldie but a goodie, a favorite, pick a direction and implement like hell. <laughs> Picking a direction is completely subjective. And all strategy is a bet. And you do have to execute like heck to get there. But the decisions on how you execute get there, and, and quite frankly, even in our observations, what a preference would be or what you saw that there were divergent, even in the room, we probably wouldn't have picked the same, the right strategic advisor. And then once you do the work and you're with the management team, do you think everyone's going to be aligned at every step along the way? Probably not. So let's take a look at um, what we did to try and find alignment and to hopefully come up with this strategy. Um, but before we go too much further, I'm going to contrast those uh, strategic advisor recommendations from a framework that I used to use at Deloitte. Very interestingly, most of my clients were north of 100 million in revenue. Some of them were one or two or 15 billion in revenue. And when they asked us to do, build strategies for them or with them, it was often to do this sort of framework. And that's the second one that uh, is in the handout there. This sort of framework, you'll notice, is just purely tactical, research, information driven, fill out the answers, and quite frankly, we know that they would sometimes go to a McKinsey or others and aggregate what we've found in these sorts of strategies to come up with uh, ultimately what strategy they're picking. I know Shell locally does that. They hire multiple, yeah, okay, you're nodding. So this is not <laughs> uncommon. For a growth company, does that really work though? For, for a $50 million company or a startup company? Not at all. If all you did was focus on the, on the framework, you would probably not get anywhere. Interestingly enough, though I hadn't worked with enough small companies to recognize that when I left. Um, so this is mostly kind of leaving advisory, leaving M&A and coming into industry where some of the, these sort of realizations I'm about to share with you have come about. Um, so I'm going to start with M&A on uh, M&A strategy. We're going to do a quick flyby. Uh, David mentioned you guys hadn't looked at a lot of M&A strategy, so I'm going to do some more of the technical side just to kind of show generally what, when you're talking M&A strategy, what that looks like. Um, I always like including this slide when I talk to Dev's classes. Um, basically, this is, uh, this is a way that um, mergers and acquisition advisors or investment bankers uh, convince companies that they should go and buy another company. Um, at the same time, this is also the rationale as to why uh, you would need to develop an M&A strategy and go, go grow this way. Um, and here is one perfect example. The company's muddling along for roughly five or eight <laughs> years, decides to go on an acquisition spree and bang, they outperform the market in a year's time by 20%. And that's really what the outcome is, is they're looking for creating uh, you know, above, uh, above average returns through going through an M&A program. And uh, again, these are slides that, that I would share to prospects saying, really, you should buy one of the companies that I'm marketing right now because this could happen to you. Um, at the same time, it has happened to folks, so hopefully that's true. And if I go through some of the, some of the rationale for this, and I'm going to use specifically two examples in our own organization. Um, here's one of the strategic rationale frameworks that we would use. The first example would be Gentech, that's a company that uh, DICORP acquired about eight years ago. Uh, to be honest, we were quite tentative about it. It was in the US, in Nevada, in resources, it was production mining, Barrick Gold, that's our biggest customer there. Uh, we are in oil field, we thought, geez, this is going to be culturally different, this is probably going to be uh, relationship-wise different, different operating environments, you know, a bunch of things like that. Went in with heightened you know, very, very heightened uh, senses about how this could go wrong. Uh, I'm going to contrast that, and so really that was uh, extended geography and actually uh, new capability, entering new markets and, and a new capability and resources, so we, we knew that this one would kind of be tough. Um, our other business unit that I'm going to describe, uh, Driller's Edge, that's our manufacturing uh, for mineral exploration, uh, our manufacturing division where we manufacture drill rod and uh, drill bits. Um, we had figured, you know what, it's actually in Canada, it's Ontario, it's manufacturing, it's in, it's in uh, one of our industries that we were already somewhat familiar with. We thought the culture is good. Ontario's not that far away. They're Canadian. This should work. 
we were completely wrong on both accounts. Gentech, uh, which was thought to be risky, was actually the very same business. It was distribution, but into minerals and mining. We are in distribution in oil field. We actually think the same way. Nevada is a four hour flight. It's very close. It's one flight from Edmonton. North Bay, Ontario is 14 hours from Edmonton, including six hours of driving. And a manufacturing mentality where you take steel rods and turn them into drill steel is totally different from blending drilling fluids in Alberta. But needless to say, that one took a few years to become successful. Uh, this year it is going to be, but that took six years. Gentech has been successful right from the start, even though we believed the reverse to be opposite going in. Uh, on some more M&A strategy here, often it's looked at for difficult to acquire assets. This is reason, and, and quite frankly, this I, I believe this is probably one of the reasons that does actually create value in M&A. Um, you know, Warren Buffett says he doesn't actually mind paying goodwill. Uh, goodwill. Uh, goodwill is one of those assets you never have to reinvest in, unlike property, plant, equipment, and buildings. And as long as you treat it well and you understand what it is, it continues to really kind of foster the business and ensure that earnings continue. Um, and this is essentially what we, uh, what we had looked at acquiring when we acquired uh, uh, Driller's Edge in Ontario. Uh, what we didn't realize was, uh, again, just some of the cultural or off-balance sheet items that we hadn't quite figured out yet. The next, uh, was there, do you have it? No, you, I just, just, yeah, I, you're familiar with culture clashes in m and Yeah, okay. And uh, this is quite common. And then synergies. Everyone has heard about synergies before. One plus one equals three. This is one of the slides where you could almost not fail as an m and advisor saying, you know, really, you should do this deal. In hindsight, though, as a CFO, if we look at, and this is also on the other hand out there, if we look at lower financing costs, I'm going to have to suggest that by diversifying, simply diversifying, and going from pure play to multi-business, sure you're bigger, but generally a pure play, well understood, strategically aligned business that can attract capital to different capital providers that has a clear purpose will often succeed in lower financing costs than just bigger. So I'm not so convinced that that's true. Next one, rationalized property, plant, and equipment. If you have redundant assets right now, get rid of them. It's only killing your return on investment. And shareholders don't really like extra buildings or extra snowmobiles or whatever is lying around that you don't need. So again, does it take an M&A to have to do this? Uh, another one would be eliminate or elimination of duplicate costs or really just becoming efficient. I, again, I'd suggest that, that, that if that's the case and you don't have the depth in your organization to understand what costs should be there or not, you probably need to be looking internally first. So I am, I am a little bit poking holes in this slide, which was often presented as a rationale for mergers and acquisitions. Here's some more information. You guys have all seen this sort of stuff floating around before. And yet this is completely counter to the first slide, which showed above average market returns. You don't, you don't show that here on the today. <laughs> that was not in the that pitch that text. <laughs> no, that one wasn't. So, you know, we've, we've now looked at, and quite frankly, every mergers and acquisition deal that I've ever seen has had some sort of strategy cited as to why they were doing it. And some were, were successful, some were not. What do you think some of the reasons were? What are the things that we probably need to think through as to why they were successful or not? Do you have any guesses? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, just like, just an obvious one is, again, um, a lot of companies will buy businesses thinking they know the business model. Yeah. So an example, like, um, like let's, let, let's look at oil and gas, right? You have an American company who's coming in and say maybe they want to invest in, um, in Fort McMurray oil sands. Yeah. But what they don't understand is it's not necessarily the same oil and gas as mining, right? So right. they're investing in a mining business where yep. maybe they'll drill. Yeah. It's totally different. So I uh, like that was that was the first the first thing I was going to comment on exactly that. 
what is your actual strategic orientation in the first place and how good is your company at understanding what is core and what is not? Often the way that you see that the M&A is justified is through the post-merger grand presentation that the CEOs put out after the deal is done, feeling really good about it, having created so much value for shareholders. But really you'd want to look at, was it actually explicitly stated in their annual reports and information forms and investor calls leading up to that point that they needed some sort of strategic objective and the M&A actually was one alternative amongst a variety of alternatives that made sense to enable that outcome. And not often do I see that that's the case. Good acquirers do often. Another one uh, would also be, what is your off-balance sheet capital position in the first place? Oh, was there another question? Yeah? Yeah, I think I was just going to touch on what you were about to say. It's okay. Like, if you have an, like excess free cash flow, then you might make a bad investment or a bad M&A because you think you have that, that money lying around. You're like, well, we've got to do something with it to buy this company. And yeah, that would be in the category of what leads to failure. I totally agree. Yeah, often free cash flow, uh, yeah, you could distribute it to shareholders, and generally shareholders do love distributions, generally. Um, but executive teams like Jets and bigger companies and doing deals, because it's fun. And uh, so free cash flow, you're right, there's agency issues that will cause for failure. Sorry. Yeah. But there was one other big one, and it's poor timing. Of, so you might make the right purchase, but at the wrong time. So an example, and maybe it ends up being a good one, was say Shell's purchase of BG. Okay. Was right at the stock, was right at the crash, right? A stock, it's Great a stock for BG. deal. It's a stock deal. Yeah. Right? So the so that, that investment goes say from forty billion to seventy billion dollars. All of a sudden a good deal is delivered back. Yeah. That does happen. Um, maybe though, uh, and I'd keep that for the finance class that you guys will take on speculation versus hedging. I'd suggest don't time the market, um, and if you were waiting and you thought it was a good deal, or you get irrationally exuberant because of market conditions, which also happens, again, does the strategy hold in different cycles of the environment? And you're right, if they hadn't looked at that, then that could be another cause. Um, but one other one I'd suggest looking at before, um, uh, before jumping into m and was what are your off-balance sheet items in the first place that you have on that left side, the green box? What are your actual processes? What are you good at? What is your core? What are your people like? Do they have a, a strategic mindset? Do they understand these sorts of things? Um, go into an M&A knowing what that is in the first place, uh, in part because you'll probably need to use some of that off-balance sheet capital to actually spend towards making sure that you're investing into the deal to make sure that it works successfully after. Uh, so let's take a look a bit more at this then. And uh, let's discuss some process and some people issues or matters. Okay, so this is an actual textbook from lying around here from about 12 years ago when I was here full time. And uh, I photocopied it. This is the one we actually used in our, uh, in our strategic planning this year. And uh, really it's just a framework for hygiene. All frameworks work. This is your typical Porter's Five Forces right here. This is your SWAT. And the reason I brought it up was because I've used it several times. I've used it for clients, I've used it for past organizations. I actually believe this works. Interestingly enough, other people have different frameworks within our management team and on our board who also believe they have frameworks that work. There is, just like we were describing earlier, there's no one strategy that is the perfect strategy. I'd suggest to you there's no one framework, but having a framework allows people to then understand what it is you're working towards and what you're going to be doing next. This, I felt, has helped us in our last go around in this strategic planning, um, in this strategic planning um, uh, initiative that we had over the last year. And this is the summary of the result of the actual report. We hired a BCom summer student for four months to collate and collect information from our executive team and managers. Um, he used, you can see the Porter's Five Forces here. You can see our SWAT here. You can see there's some really interesting spider diagrams here. And the whole concept was we wanted to come up with essentially a two-page summary for our board. In the five and a half years I've been at that Corp, I'd say this is the first time that we actually had full management alignment on what was true, what wasn't, what was hearsay, what was uh, not, because this was the time that we actually had a 
bit of a process and a framework to collect everything, to cast all nets, to dispel all myths, to seek disconfirming evidence, and to actually give everyone a voice. And in this one, what I found to be particularly interesting was we had heard from our sales folks, oh, there's price sensitivity, buyers are huge, there's low cost of switching, this is why pricing is such a difficult uh, matter. And I come from Deloitte Advisory where we used to charge thousands of dollars an hour for what we felt was a good value of <laughs> dispensing ideas. And here we are selling what I believe to be world-class rods where I feel we should be getting a higher price. And actually investigating into it a bit further, I started to realize and see the information and actually see third-party research that suggested this is accurate. And the next slide shows the research that helped convince me. Similarly, industry key success factors, fewer defle defects is important, but you need to balance with efficiency. And we saw how actually one of our competitors had completely invested into automation, had lots of less labor costs, but when the, when the uh, mining industry hit a downturn back in about 20, 2012, they were left with this massive capital investment with huge debt burden, and they couldn't actually respond to the changing industry conditions. So you gotta watch that as well. And here's the, I guess that's the spider web diagram that came from a, a third party research group that showed you know, price sensitivity, buyer size, low cost switching actually being meaningful in this industry. So it kind of helped us to all understand, okay, what are the things that we need to do to then hopefully win on these forces to then be able to compete? Yeah, and I'm not gonna present our full strategy. That's still uh, with our board and it's a little bit private, so I'm showing you kind of the, the punch on the board. And here's, here's uh, Here's a bit of our SWOT and uh, some strengths, and some positives and weaknesses. And again, just a couple of other things. One of the other big conclusions that we came up with and we understood was we had, we had, we still have, I'd say some of the lowest defect, highest quality assured manufacturing in our drill rods in Ontario. And we never really quite put our, our you know, put a, put a name around it until this process where we all work together. We knew we had phenomenal rods, we knew we had low failure rates, we knew customers loved it, but it's not like we were building them out of titanium or doing something truly leading edge technology. And we couldn't really say they were the best rods because they did have the same actual, same inputs with the same steel from the same, I guess, uh, uh, you know, base uh, suppliers, like all that same stuff, but we did have manufacturing know-how process, people with 30 years of manufacturing experience on staff and it really helped us to then better understand how do we differentiate ourselves in the market, which we also figured out and we realized by looking at a few websites, some of our competitors, folks who are half our size actually had much, much better marketing material out there. So my point here is before the actual process, which we hired, had to hire externally a BCom student to literally collect information that we just kept shooting to them all summer, compile it, help put it together and summarize it for our board, we were all looking in slightly different directions. After this point, we then got to the same place where we were able to at least establish what was real and what was not as a management team. But that wasn't quite enough. What we started to realize was that by going through the process, by opening our minds to being able to challenge assertions, by actually saying what is the cost of capital, what isn't, what is our differentiator, what isn't, is it true we have the best rods or is it our manufacturing processes? By dunning down, we were, we were able to at least come up with what we believe to be the drivers that were going to be successful for us. And one of the resources that I'm sharing with you on this first part anyways, is really just doing the basics well doesn't sound like a very exciting strategic orientation. However, doing the basics well is actually quite hard. It takes a lot of effort takes a lot of team alignment. And this uh, article here uh, by uh, Harvard Business Review, it's about a year old, year and a bit old. This was the one where Google basically said they could be in, in anything. They could be in car manufacturing, they could be in oil field, they could be in any industry, because they believe they're actually pretty good at strategic planning, good governance, sales effectiveness, organizational structure, uh, makes sense, people growth and development, good conversations, effective meetings. None of that actually sounds very groundbreaking or very highly strategic. But pulled together, it actually is very powerful, I believe. And that's what the thesis is of this article. So we'll share these articles after. 
So this is good so far, but we're, I don't think we're quite there yet for growth companies. I've referred to Google, they're huge. What about growth companies? What about startups? I mean, you guys are MBAs, and there must be a person with an inkling entrepreneurial underpinning or two in here. Anyone? Any entrepreneur? Yeah, there's one, two, couple people, three, four. Okay, so there's five. And, you know, you're taking an MBA. In the back of your mind, you're going, you know, maybe two or three or four of my friends sitting around a beer are going to come up or drinking a beer are going to come up with that business plan we want to do this. I think we really only touched the outer layer of the onion for how strategic planning really works at growth companies or for mid-market companies that, quite frankly, have people wearing many hats or in, in that growth orientation. So let's try that. Let's dig in a little deeper and take a look because while we have processes and frameworks and strategic advisors and all these other sort of an m and best practices, what we really haven't gotten to yet is people matters, actual strategic problem selection. What is our strategic issue that we're going to address? How are we going to come up with it? And then beyond that, you've got to address things within an organization or a growth company like skills to actually carry it out. And then awareness of other things such as politics, seniority, people involved. All of this managed, I believe, is largely a part of being able to conduct strategy well in a growth organization. And I also think this is probably one of the tougher areas. So I'm going to do my best to address it. It's taken me kind of five and a half years in industry to come to these conclusions. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to dive in a little deeper here. Um, but maybe I'll pause. Are there any questions up to this point? Anything to reconfirm? I see you nodding, Dev. No, it's, it's people are interested, so they're just waiting for the next slide. Okay, <laughs> okay. And feel free to pause me or ask questions along the way too. Um, in what ways can management recognize uh, the nature of strategic problems? I'm just going to draw something on the board here. Okay, perfect. Okay, first off I think I'm going to start with is frameworks. And we talked a bit about when you would hire a Deloitte versus when you would hire a Shearlaws, which is really the type of person who we hired to really help with more kind of smaller or medium sized organizations where you have the people issues tied in with the strategic issues all into one package as opposed to just more of the strategic and external environment versus you know, a human resource, human capital group that focuses on people. And I'd suggest that those frameworks and how you approach them actually varies quite a bit on your company size, your growth, your history, the nature of the people. If you're all a group of five MBAs and everyone's being trained in the industry and it's a startup, that's a lot different than if you are at a software company, there's one person who understands what it is the technology is, then there's salespeople, and quite frankly, quite a bit different from you know, trying to do something more conventional like starting up a wildcatting uh, oil and gas firm or collecting a group of folks who are operating equipment in the oil field. Very, very different frameworks used at different times and the company size and company culture, I would suggest, will influence or orient how you approach strategic planning. The next one, the layers, I found this to be uh, one, of the most, uh, one of the most interesting parts that we had discussed in our last strategic planning um, uh, process here. It goes something like this. It starts with uh, your purpose plus core values. I'm just going to start with that. Everybody familiar generally with the purpose, mm -hmm. which would be typically defined as how others see you or your customer sees you and then core values. And core values would be the impact that you're actually trying to bring about. The next one would be vision. This one is a picture of the future. What you actually want to be when you achieve. This is the internal one, that you take the external vision, or the external, sorry, purpose, aligning it to the internal vision,
The next one would be your core strategy, aligning to your vision. And this is where you define things like where you're going to play, what geographies, what product lines, what suites, how to win, what is your actual differentiator, what is your value proposition, how are you planning on winning, your capabilities, as well as your gaps and deficiencies, and then your ultimate strategy. How are you actually communicating this? And then from there, which ones are your operational tactics and which ones are your priorities? Because generally when you're creating a strategy, you're looking at doing things like trying to grow or achieve greater market share or increase uh, gross margin or increase customer loyalty or retention, something like that. And which ones are your actual priorities that you're going to put above the others and which ones are your operating conditions that you're going to bring, uh, bring forth and focus on. Interestingly enough, this took us the whole 100 days to figure out. We're a 60-year-old company. And we had been working on this for five years, crystallizing our core values. Actually, we used Francis Fry out of Harvard. We flew to Boston six times just to figure out our core values. And it uh, took us a few more years to figure out the vision. And then the core strategy took us about 100 days. And to be honest, going through multiple sessions, discussing it, bringing information to the table, using our foundational data from the environmental scan allowed us to come up with insights and understandings that we had never had before as a company, realize what it is that we actually have that makes us special in our eyes of our customers, be able to test it, be able to openly attack the ideas because we had a forum to do it as opposed to the, the person. So it really brought about this sort of this testing and acceptance that I had never seen in actually in any organization. And so kind of what I'm going at here is in a growth organization or a medium-sized company, while it's okay in a Deloitte for national or global to come and say, okay, here's our strategy, now go carry it out. In a medium or a growth company, that won't work at all. This sort of process is, uh, is the thing is the learning that I had in the last little bit? Yes. Sorry, just to clarify, the purpose was what your customers or externally what they were seeing. How others values, see you. Yeah. The core values is what you're seeing in yourself. In yourself, that's true. But your core values are generally um, how you would react, and hopefully, it would translate so far down to you know along the chain such that the executives understand. Uh, that when working with each other and looking at and evaluating again growth opportunities, proving business plans, figuring out whether or not there's going to be traction in, in one of our initiatives, does it actually align to what our core values are and do we feel we're acting properly within how the framework of the norms are for us to be acting? Generally, those are also what customers will see. And what we want to do is have that translate down right from the top to where a shipper receiver would understand that if there is a customer that needs something versus a supplier who's at the door, what's the choice at that point? Do we actually have our, our, uh, our orientation figured out properly? Because in some cases, you may actually need to take the supplier's delivery because of what it is that the nature of your business is. In some cases, if you're service oriented, you'll need to deal with the customer delivery. You want to be able to have uh, values that everybody understands and that align to business decisions. I see, Dev, do you have a question? Yeah, just following up on that. Some of that. I mean, if you're a smaller or mid cap company, um, that sounds pretty daunting in terms of time, people, resources. So at the same time, you were operating and trying to make a margin. Yeah. So how did you play that side? Because I mean, you know, you're trying to find purpose. You're pretty sure you have a purpose that day yep. when you walk in. It's not like you don't have any purpose. Yeah. You know? So how did you how did you work that? Great question. Being an oil field in a <laughs> prolonged downturn, um, being in mining, which is upturned quite a bit in the last bit, but was also in a prolonged downturn, and uh, feeling the effects year over year of some wins and some losses and wanting a little more command over our destiny, uh, what, it, what it was was hard work and desire, really, amongst the management team. It's easy to be a little more reactive. It's easy to come to a meeting not having had to think through whether or not it aligns to strategy, making a call on the fly, being able to come up with something clever and move on. So does that mean extra hours of people staying after work or coming uh, on Saturday and things like that? I mean, 
Well, that um, might be overly practical, but people have to, you know, yeah. get people on board. And, and so the hundred days, it was yeah. spread out. Uh, so, for example, this the last session yesterday in Calgary was just one day, and so um, uh, I didn't not I didn't get to you know um, not do my day duties, uh, but I'm also really lucky. I have very very strong people working on my team. I've got you know three controllers and some managers and a bunch of people that are all fantastic at what they do, and they were able to carry the load with me with me gone, and we're pretty good at that throughout the company. Uh, but it did take a deliberate effort to make sure that we wanted to tighten this up because really what we're doing is we're trying to plan for five to eight years out solid strategy so that we have clear direction in our budgeting in the next two or three years but oriented towards something that's longer term. I know I know we have you know, time but just a follow up that's really related okay. to this. Just to clarify, when you're going through those, yep. you're actually talking about confirming them widely in the company and with customers. No, as reality, good point. No, no. it's... Uh, executives and kind of directors and then manager level and the executives start with the core and then we bring it out and include managers in those sessions and directors okay. correct so it's actually at most it was uh, 12 people in a session that's right yeah yeah I'm going to see if I can't articulate the sure and maybe just before we go too yeah. far I am uh, halfway through and it is 902 <laughs> Um, I could take more questions. I can zip through the last. I can. I might go a little over. What's the class preference? Take question and then move forward. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So quickly, my question is, and this is something in my um, reflection paper that I just submitted. This took a, a, a bunch of time. This topic that you're talking about seems to be part of the job of certain work roles. It's an important part of the organization. And what I think you're doing is you're balancing operational needs where people can relate to really readily to like you said it takes a lot of effort to try and connect these connect these dots like you have on the board so I can see why it's such a form of competitive advantage if you can get it right and why it's so hard so my question is to what degree is this an issue of not having the right people in the right seats versus it's always going to take this amount of effort yeah um, so good to great the very first uh, the very first take home on their seven bullets on Stephen Covey's bullets is have the right people. That's a CEO job for the executive if the executive are supposed to be the ones who are strategic thinking. As a CFO, your number one job is to work well with the management team. Your distant second job is to apply finance knowledge and your distant, distant third is to operate the company. So. If you're in the seat of the CEO, by all means, you are responsible for making sure there's competencies around the table. However, you don't just fire people because they're not doing a good job. Yeah. Uh, you know, ideally, the, the you know the, the three take homes are there are you know make sure that there's an authentic or actual genuine uh, interaction. If there is need for learning, address it. If people have wobbly logic or not enough background. Help them get the resources to get there. Train them. Send them to con to um, to get the training, uh, and you know that sort of thing. Those sorts of approaches work generally much better than uh, just uh, swapping out people. But that's often required, um, and I've seen in a bunch of examples where when a new CEO comes in and there is a massive cultural misalignment between the CEO, their vision, and what they need to carry out, and maybe where an organization was before that isn't yeah. achieving its objectives. By all means, that often makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I'm going to do a bit of a abridged version, and uh, I'll do my best to finish uh, on time. Well, close to on time. As we've just been going through here with the people uh, matters, um, my argument is is that leadership is about people, and this is core to a successful strategy in a growth organization. Um, uh, problem identification and actual accurate problem identification for a winning strategy is influenced by leadership capacity which is I think your comment on the people at the table do they have the capabilities so I was going this is really um, one of the tools that was used in our organization uh, by our strategic advisor and the concept here was the growth journey very quickly you start up you feel excited and then there's these walls which are the kind of you know this is the point where you actually think you have something now you have to quit your day job do you and so there was this concept of you feel excited, it goes into frantic, now you're investing, maybe you're leveraging up your house, putting money in, 
good times, relaxed, payback, all of a sudden, you know, cottages, cars, and boats are in your, in your life at that point as an entrepreneur or a growth company, then things start to change a bit. You realize your overhead is higher than it should be, and those gross margins that were coming in are starting to get eroded, and you can't keep a handle on all the different customers that are out there. And then, ultimately, you come up to these points in time where then you realize you have to kind of pick a direction and be able to actually execute on it. And where I was going with this is, if this is one entrepreneur's journey, generally all of your executives, and probably your entire executive committee, are also gonna be feeling this, and they're all not gonna be on the same page. It is highly complex to actually manage all of these different people, these orientations, feelings, and, and this, quite frankly, is just part of any growth journey. Um, so we, I got one last thing I wanted to draw here. This quite a bit. <laughs> Has anybody seen this before? Yeah? yeah? As an actual framework, or you've just experienced it? Uh, in, it is an um, alternate dispute resolution course here, and they talk about that same triangle. Victim, hero, and victim, hero, villain. Yeah, victim, hero, Yeah, and what, what uh, helped our management team realize is it's very easy to fall into the drama triangle, especially when you're dealing with people, especially when you're coming about new and scary instances such as strategic planning, which could change the direction of an organization, change the framework of how we think, and quite frankly, change the outcomes for all of us. We had to refer to the drama triangle many, many times. Luckily, what's happened is, is it's gotten to the point where it's not a gotcha, it's a gentle reminder. And what we're trying to do is, is come up with, um, oh, this is where the, the answers are on how to fix this. where you can still challenge but not bully, where you can still create, not necessarily be a victim and poor me, but come up with ideas, and rather than rescuing someone, help coach them and understand it. And the concept is, is it's these kind of emotional zones of self-regulation, which come into a highly charged concept, like strategic planning, which really uh, impacts your uh, future quite a bit. Dev, I've reached the time now. No, no, 10 more. Okay, is that, is that okay? Okay, because I have a bit more on, on how we've been managing and addressing, addressing this. Um, and really this talks about mobilizing, mobilizing groups and implementation. And I'm not gonna go into any formal frameworks for implementing. I had, I think, a, few, a number of years ago when Dev first invited me to come out, and I saw it, Deloitte worked really well with billion dollar companies or large transactions in industry or with growth companies or growth organizations. I found that it's very important to have frameworks and it's very important to have informal techniques. But building, building stakeholder mandates, generating action and developing consensus is, in my view, as core to a successful strategy as developing the strategy itself and writing it down. Oh, what's uh, No, we were just saying, hey, we got it. You got it? <laughs> we're talking about our own project. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and did you guys cover this off already, this sort of stuff? Well, this was like stuff that we had core to. Okay. For uh, the organization that's going to build the business, I'm sure. Okay, and uh, and did you guys come to a really good conclusion on how this all works, or are you wanting to see my version? Oh, curious. No. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, just a couple takeaways, a few. There's three big ones, and the first one really is is on focus, and really the language and expectations of the executive team need to be strategic, while the language and, and expectations of the front line needs to be operational. And it comes down to this concept of requisite uncertainty. And this is really the table here, where um, essentially the performance of frontline managers and people who are throughout the organization actually executing, actually talking to customers, actually ordering, 
It needs to live up to the strategic commitments of the executive team. This understanding is essential and, is, and brings alignment from the organization up at the top right through to folks who are new or at the lower levels. And what it does is it helps to clearly align interactions so that it is clear what people's roles and responsibilities are. Secondly, what it does is when you do this sort of thing, you bring clarity to what the strategy actually means to different groups of people. It needs to be distributed and be able to be articulated right through from the bottom to the top of the organization, not just in one management team member's head or just the CEO's head. If that happens, there's a good chance you're probably not going to be able to even start with, a, with this sort of focus and this alignment and the right language. The second one would be investing and partnering. Our highest performing business unit by far uh, has been um, our uh, Fraxan Translating Group. And quite frankly, our VP there and I and the management team were quite open, had, done, had many discussions, talked about strategy quite frequently, looked at market dynamics, brought ideas to the table. It's not easy. Uh, she was trained in this and is trained in this. Uh, I was, our other executives who were involved in this project uh, uh, were, but it was still really hard. The concept, however, though, was there was better understanding and alignment in that organ, in that business unit than other business units that were more siloed and that didn't have frequent uh, interactions and that didn't have partnering. And the concept here, really the, I guess the tipping point would be, um, and I'm going to go to M&A first and then back to organizational and organic growth. There are processes that you would use in in different scenario, in situations. In m and I'm using this one, because at the end of the day, whether or not an M&A is actually successful or not, your board is gonna judge you on whether or not your process made sense. If your process, if you didn't have a process and the M&A works out, you probably still should get fired as an executive, because the chances you were just betting. If the process went really well, they already know, your board knows that the chances of success are much higher. And if the process was really well, but it market timing or whatever didn't work out in the example that you used, they're still probably not going to uh, pun uh, punitively come against you because you didn't actually follow a logical, rational process that you collected ideas and thoughts. So one thought is, is that this is a good way to ensure that you're crossing T's and dotting I's and bringing the best out of the people in your organization. Organic growth is no different. And yet the mindset is different. When you do an M&A, you know you're going to have a counterparty. I'm going to have another CFO in that organization I have to deal with. Our ops person is going to have another ops person. Our manufacturing people are going to have to talk to each other. Our supply chain people are going to have to talk to each other. We're going to have to come up with strategic plans that work. In organic growth, it's not that that's exactly how everyone's thinking. It's not like your salespeople wander into finance, say, hey, I'm thinking of these new customers and these margins. How do we talk about whether or not it's fully loaded and makes sense? Finance doesn't always talk about, hey, what are your uh, strategic planning growths? What is your working capital needs? And can we plan that into our financial model to make sure the liquidity is taken care of? And yet, in an M&A, you would do that. Interesting how both require the same level of kind of interactions and openness and partnering, but you put a label on something and people act differently. The third one, and this is the most difficult, would be reinforcing actual value discipline and dealing with people's perceptions. One of the interesting things that I found at Deloitte, it was easy to work cross-functional on projects, on growth projects, growing up business units with anybody from any part of the country. We all had similar designations, we were cut from similar cloths, similar educational background, similar work experience, we worked in the same office, had the same processes. We were very collaborative together. In industry or organizations or growth companies, none of that's the same. In fact, you may be the only MBA with a finance background at the table discussing a very complex project or problem where you need operational people, you need HR people, you need all of those different points of view coming together. And this is, I think, where part of the art in a successful strategy and a successful strategy execution process uh, comes around. And really what I'm talking about is change management. I'm talking about aligning behaviors and having people work together successfully. I'm talking about, uh, and doing this, quite frankly, in a way where it works for people. Um, I've come across this resource, and I'll share the link later, on how, in fact, 
big things such as cultural change, which is really what alignment is, is socially dense. And at the end of the day, people don't aren't aren't don't resist change for change's sake. Usually, it's intelligent their responses. They may resist a loss of status and power, which is intelligent. And you know the counter to that is start with performance accountability. Make sure they clearly understand what it is that they're responsible for, for good alignment. They may resist injustice, perception of change, or an imbalance on background, and a perception of not understanding what's going on, which is also intelligent. You would resist that in an organization. Performance management is often the antidote for that. And the last one would be change may also cause a need for learning, which needs to be properly addressed. And you will hear sometimes in some organizations we've always done it that way. If learning is needed to be addressed, it, and it may not be your colleague or the person you're reporting to in the M&A, but the fact that learning needs to happen to, in order for organizational change or for behavioral change to happen, um, these are topics that the executive team and managers should be talking about for effective adoption of what it is that the new plan is needed in, a str in strategic execution or strate strategy development. And in smaller companies, this is particularly difficult because people wear multiple hats. If you think of a startup of 20 or 30 people, you don't have a sales department and a marketing department, and you don't have a finance department and an accounting department and a treasury department, and you don't have, I can, I can go on and on, supply chain and operations may be in fact the same. So now what you're talking about is how people spend their time, which is even a little bit more challenging, which is also why processes like this and understandings like this are so important when developing strategies. Um, in conclusion, another Harvard Business Review resource that was actually just came out this month talked about essentially how collaboration is a socially dense, um, a socially dense, uh, um, uh, difficult challenge, and you know the things that you can do to actually make sure it works well. And there's, I'm not going to cover off what this resource is, and uh, but I highly recommend it as a read. You know, reinforcing the identity at the, about the groups at the table on what you're working on, uh, reaffirming their legitimacy, make sure you understand why the group is there and that the group does and that other people do. Reassert control, make sure that the purpose is there and that they also understand what is it and who has the decision rights. And if you find there's an overlap in all of these areas, you probably have a control threat, which means you probably have collaboration going off the rails, at which point your strategy development or your strategy execution probably won't work. Uh, so this is an excellent article. And really, in conclusion, these are the three things. Um, people, and really what I'm talking about is the importance of the cultural capital to be strategic. Is it embedded and do people understand this? Do they, how do people in the organization choose what to do? What do we aspire to do as an organization? What are we focusing on? What is our degree of risk? Do we understand the importance of vision? Do we understand mentoring? All of these sorts of things are important when developing a strategy for a growth organization. Governance, second one, and governance clarity. Is, it, is the strategy a direction articulated by management, vetted by the board or whoever owns the company, and is the direction set amongst a variety of options? You need this sort of clarity in order for people to make decisions, as you pointed out. And then the last one really is just process. You know, do you have a balanced view? Do you know where things could fail? Are you looking at just the positives? Is it half-baked or the opinion that you're basing your decisions on? If you can figure out these three keys, I'd argue your growth strategy and your growth company is probably gonna succeed. And in the words of the Shopify CEO, uh, you know, he said he looks like, what he looks for in his organization as he leads it is he wants to be on a journey doing something difficult with his friends. And I think if you feel that way, you're probably on the right track. I'm just uh, really curious. When you were talking about the drama triangle, is that something you actually discuss with the leadership? Did you draw it out and say, Bob, are you a bully today? Or how can we make you a challenge? How did you approach that? How did you find success? Levity helps, uh, <laughs> a big smile, a high five, um, also uh, referring to it. All of us are familiar with it and really it's been socialized throughout all of our 
management directors and executive ranks. And uh, you'd be surprised at how collaborative people are and want to be when we all have the same understanding and really training now on how to identify these situations and de-escalate them. And what it does is it really, it's, it's actually helped us all as an organization have really healthy, good, positive conversations. We're still gonna have fireworks. We're still gonna erupt. In fact, that's an important part of all of this. However, if you're having fireworks and erupting, make sure you say, hey, this is in the concept of being a challenger. You know, I often, I often use the phrase, you know, the best insurance against a bad decision is dissent. Let me dissent. That's often different than, you know, I have an MBA from the U of A. <laughs> Let me tell you as I go on. So even if it's just being self-aware of how messages are being delivered and what is your actual, what are you trying to achieve here? And, and, and framing it in that regard. Yeah. After you developed a purpose and that, that you spent 100 days developing that. Uh, that this, whole, this whole, uh, this whole yeah, mm -hmm. core element here, yeah. Do you see tangible differences in your business? People feel aligned. Mm -hmm. Decisions are easier. When we say we're doing things to be strategic, we actually mean it. There's less off the cuff and ad hoc and more being deliberate. And decisions are more distributed. So people actually understand why we're making decisions. It's not just in one person's head. So that, uh, they're all, those are all intangibles, but I would also argue as a team, those are the tangible things that you actually need to see to be successful together. So that, those are the outcomes we've seen. Our, um, our financial results, uh, that'll, be, that'll remain to be seen. And really, this is, not in, this is not supposed to be impacting budgeting in the next, in the next year. It's, uh, it's an orientation for kind of three to eight years out is, uh, is the thought, where we want to be. Yeah? I'm just curious, were you guys influenced by Roger Martin's book, Playing the Win, and talking about getting into where to play and how to win? That's the book we all read going into this. Okay. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. Was there a part from that that you saw that ties into all of this? Um, no, but that book uh, was, so I worked for ACO and that book was, was also uh, used in setting strategy about four or five years ago. Um, right now for like developing winning aspirations and those kind of goals we mentioned. I just, I just sort of recommend the language, I'm curious. Yep, that's one of the resources we used. We used a whole bunch. We used a mosaic of resources. Mm -hmm. And people were encouraged to share what it was that they thought was a good strategic framework or a good article or other things like that to help uh, to help kind of bring all of us to the same page. Sure. Yeah. How, how dynamic is the strategy? Yeah. Um, we are aiming for it to be fairly dynamic at the same, uh, at the same point we, we use our board I think quite effectively where we try and focus on strategic issues when we're discussing with them and at the end of the day it's hard to have a conversation with board members if you don't actually put four walls around it, a deadline, publish it, produce it, put it out there so that you can debate it. And there does have to be a point in time where you, you pin it and produce it. So we are still doing that. That said, um, our process is dynamic. When we look at where investments are going, that's a continuous process. When we look at whether or not our actual strategy and what we need to do for here for core strategy, I would argue, no, that's not changing. That is the one that we're being, um, we're looking at where investments can go, whether people and new hires are aligned, that in fact we're planning to build that way. So there's that core strategy, but the elements of around execution and thinking and you know tactics will change for sure. Based I do, on market. I do checkpoints where you, uh, where you reevaluate the core strategy, or does it have to be a Internal, something big that happens, seismic shift that challenges that core strategy, then you reevaluate. We haven't gotten there far enough yet. Um, in the last, well, five and a half, six years, we started up a couple of business units, uh, did an acquisition, uh, did a few of these things in the absence of a strategy, of an actual formalized, you know, big C strategy that we can say is our strategy. We've, we've had things written down that were aspiring objectives and you know, balance scorecards and 
things that tied to what the company had always been doing and was good at. Um, uh, but at this point, I think this was such an energizing process that uh, um, you know we're not we're not intending on really languish. We're we're intending on keeping it refreshed every twenty four to thirty six months. Yeah. So when you say it, it took a hundred days, but not. No, it wasn't consecutive. So we, how long did it actually take? So you need the mental space in between to let mull things over. Uh, one of the tactics used in this process was uh, when we were looking at strategic alternatives, which we built out um, really just a quick page on every different alternative, quite a bit different ones for our business units. Uh, you had to vote on which one you liked the best and which one you liked the least. And if you liked it the least, you were then put into that group with that strategy that you liked the least, and you had to declare what are the things that needed to be true for this to actually happen. And you had to crisply put it down. So you got your chance to destroy that strategy as best you can by saying, what need, this needs to be true for this to happen. And then we actually, as a group, went through and said, is that true? Does that need to be true? Crisped it up into one or two or three tests. And then we had a couple of weeks to go and pull up some research, take a look, validate, and what that did is, is that did shoot holes and actually, yes, it's true, that strategy is not gonna work. Those assertions were found to be true. Or that strategy, in fact, is holding water and we need to treat it a little more seriously. And we didn't have the naysayers, the people who didn't believe in that strategy, do the work. We had the proper people do the work. If it was in operations or finance or wherever, we had the people who you know, had the backgrounds and skills and capabilities to answer the question. So it was a good way to build consensus. Well, on that note, I know we can have a lot more questions, a lot more discussion, but it's almost time. And I, I wanted to say thanks again. Yeah. 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 Stay for a second, we'll walk out. Uh, sure. We're about, we're about yeah. finished. We're friends for a while. So it, it's interesting. Uh, Cam's journey is one that I'm hoping all of you will be taking over the next few years, honestly. Um, you know, as strategic thinkers, planners, executors, it is, a, it is kind of a lifelong journey, honestly. Uh, lots of twists and turns, but uh, this is one stop along the way. It's been, it's been a pleasure, guys. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and thanks for your support, and hope to see you around. Thank you. Yeah.